Welcome to The Whole Pineapple. I'm Ruby Boris. And I'm Ann Judge. The Whole Pineapple is a podcast about wellness focused around fertility. And on these weekly mini episodes, we bring you bite-sized ideas for you to snack on. Like breathing exercises, book reviews, maybe we'll review some scientific research, or we'll share some wellness and fertility stories from our listeners. So if you're looking for a tip or a trick related to your fertility and well-being, then you've come to the right place. Let's dig in. Hey, hey, hey. Welcome back to The Whole Pineapple. I'm Ruby Boris. I'm Ann Judd. And we have a really fun episode today. Um, we're bringing in some new research. You know how we all, we Ann and I, we really love our research. So we get to dive into something that's kind of up and coming. Mm-hmm. So I'm just going to jump right in and introduce our guests. We have two today, so we're extra fun. So we have Dr. Hanna Kaliova, the Director of Clinical Research for the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. She has conducted several clinical trials using a plant-based diet in the treatment of diabetes and metabolic disease. Her previous research has shown that plant-based diet leads to improvement in metabolism and addresses multiple mechanisms behind diabetes. As a member of the American Diabetes Association, And as a board member of the Diabetes and Nutrition Study Group of the European Association for the Study of Diabetes, Dr. Kaliova is directly involved in the process of updating the nutritional recommendations for patients with diabetes. And then we also have Macy Sutton. Macy is an occupational therapist. Bless you. (laughs) As somebody who has a son that we use lots of (laughs) occupational therapists. So great. Um, By training with nearly eight years of work experience in clinics and hospitals. And then in late 2021, she transitioned to a non-clinical research coordinator role at the Physician Committee for Responsible Medicine. Macy is passionate about health and wellness and the opportunity to share the forthcoming evidence gained from this endometriosis study. So welcome, both of you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. It's always towards the end of the bios that my tongue just says like, okay, nope, nope, we're done. (laughs) It's because everybody that we talk to is impressive. You were talking to someone that like, they wrote an article. (laughs) It's like you have all these uh, titles and uh, past research. This is Bob. Welcome, Bob. (laughs) (laughs) So first of all, like, what is the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine? Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine is a nonprofit organization uh, that provides nutrition education and research. Macy and I are a part of the research team. The nutrition team is more interested in how to bring all the information to people, how to bring all the educational program and make sure that people hear about it. And we're talking about endometriosis today. So that is kind of the problem we're trying to address. So like, give us kind of like an overview of the study. What was the hypothesis and what are we trying to learn? The endometriosis study, we are currently recruiting for it. The idea behind it is we're looking to see if a low fat plant-based diet um, will have an effect on symptoms of endometriosis. So in particular, we're looking at pain, inflammation, and quality of life, which we're assessing through questionnaires and blood tests. Um, We're also looking at the gut microbiome and how that changes. Our hypothesis is that a low-fat plant-based diet will improve some of the symptoms of endometriosis, but that is what we are currently looking to explore with the study. And is this building on earlier studies? Have you had like, you know, other people have done smaller things where that show that this is kind of something that you think has a good chance of having an improvement in symptoms? That's exactly right. And there's just like small evidence that we're putting together that makes us think there may be something behind this. We have some stories of people whose health has improved uh, on a plant-based diet. Uh, including the pain in endometriosis, but there's not really a randomized clinical trial. We like to see like a bigger evidence for this approach. So the study, it's randomized clinical trial then? That's correct. That's the strongest possible uh, design to show the effectiveness of an approach. Uh, Let's say you know, due, due to seasonal change, um, the pain somehow improves in, even in the control group who do, don't make any dietary changes. You want to see how the intervention compares to the control. 
So tell us about like, if I was a participant in your study and I got randomized to be in the group, what would you be doing? Like, are you giving people a specific meal plan or yeah, yeah. what's your actual uh, process like? People who are in the plant-based diet group receive weekly support sessions. So as a group, the clinical research team comes together with a dietitian and a health coach and all of the participants who are in this group, the plant-based group. And we come together weekly to educate the participants on different aspects of a plant-based diet, do a little bit of problem solving, help with meal planning, do some cooking demonstrations. So really just try to support them in this transition to the new diet. Each week we check in to see if there are any challenges that we can help address. And then outside of the weekly support group meetings, um, educational classes, we have the participants meet with our health coach and they speak with her for however long they need to, one time a week outside of the class. And she targets more specifically meal planning and grocery shopping and recipe ideas for each participant based on their needs. But we really try to provide all of the participants as much support as we can and education. That was my next question. So are the controls still getting to have health coaching? It's just they're not focusing on the plant-based part? Right. So the control group does not get the weekly health coaching but they are still submitting their weight each week. At the end of the study, we provide the control group the education that was provided to the plant-based diet group. So they still get to learn about it once the study is finished. And what's the time frame? How long is your your study of each group of participants? It is a 12-week study. And also they're in constant contact with Macy. is amazing. She got all the support they need. The control group also receives four sessions throughout the 12 weeks. So it's not that intense, but they have some group sessions to share their experience, how if they've observed any particular triggers for their pain, anything that would be helpful. So they also have a small group where they can share and get some support. So at the end of the 12 weeks, are they just done or do they switch roles and then go into the opposite category? So for our study, at the end of the 12 weeks, they are just finished, but the control group is given the information so that if they want to try it out on their own, they can. But at this point, we're not doing a crossover. How many people do you have going through at one time when you're doing these group sessions? Like how many participants are there usually? We started off with a small pilot group, uh, but we're hoping to expand it. So initially we had seven participants going through the program and now we're recruiting again. Uh, So if someone qualifies, they can contact us and we'll be happy to screen them. That's awesome. And yeah, we've talked about before on the show that nutrition research is so hard to do Mm -hmm. um, because one, you can't, the control is really hard. You kind of know if you're eating broccoli or you're not, (laughs) but then also any kind of change is really hard for people. So dropout can be a problem too. That I imagine is something that's, that you guys have been thinking about. And do you have an idea for like how long you want the study to go to how many people you want to get? We're hoping to get to an N of 120. That is the goal. So we plan to just continue doing um, replications for however long we need to until we get to that point. As of now, you've kind of been in the Washington, D.C. area, but there is some hope to expand. That's exactly right. If there is an OBGYN listening who would like to collaborate with us and who would be able to refer their patients, then by all means, please contact us. And we'd love to expand the study also to other parts of the U.S. We'll put the contact information, the website for the study, but also Macy's contact information. If you want to contact um, either as a potential participant or somebody who wants to partner and get in on this research, you can find that in our show notes. And then we'll also post it on social. So as you say, also for participants, you mentioned briefly testing, like what kind of physical testing are you having people do? Just kind of like how taxing is this besides the meetings? How often are you having to have blood draws or like what else are you looking at? For all of the participants, we do a blood draw at the beginning of the study and then at the end of the study. So at week zero and at week 12, we also at those two time points, give them a gut microbiome kit for them to send a stool sample to a lab. 
We have them submit their weight on a weekly basis. So they're each provided a scale so that all of the scales are the same brand and self-calibrating. And they just submit their weight each week through um, a link that's provided. We also take their height at baseline just to make sure that we have a standardized measure for each of them based on a tool in our office. Um, we'll have questionnaires and that is at the beginning, the midpoint and at the end. At the beginning and end, they also submit a three-day diet record. So for three days prior to the start of the study, they record everything that they're eating and drinking. And then again, at the end of the study, prior to the final day of the study, they record for three days everything they're eating and drinking. And at the midpoint, rather than looking at three days, we just have them do a 24-hour recall where they just tell us what they've had to eat and drink over the last one day. And I believe that that's all of the measures. It is somewhat time intensive, but we try to make it as easy as possible. What well, is nice that you give the materials at the end, because I'd imagine everyone that signs up, they're doing it because they're at least moderately interested in this idea of trying to improve um, nutrition and become more plant-based. So that way, even if you don't get assigned to the uh, intervention arm at first, you know you're still going to get some of that resources at the end. Yeah, exactly. And we're happy to share the resources with everyone. And for the sake of research, you know, holding off with the diet change for 12 weeks is definitely doable. If we're talking about people with what we call quote unquote regular menstrual cycles, then that's about three menstrual cycles. So it should give plenty of time for that kind of fluctuation in endometriosis pain that can come and go. Does it matter if patients are on suppression, like if they're on hormonal contraception or if they've been on Depo-Lupron or something to kind of manage their endometriosis symptoms? It doesn't matter. One thing that we do take into consideration for the initial and the final blood draws, for the only two blood draws in the study, if someone is menstruating regularly, we will have them come in on days seven to 10 of their menstrual cycle. If they're not menstruating or if they're menstruating so irregularly that they really don't know when it's going to come next, we'll just take that into account, make note of it. They can come in for their blood draws whenever, but we alter some of the hormones that we're looking at based on if they're menstruating or not. So if people are listening who are potentially a clinic or an office that might be interested in finding out more, like what would be the commitment from a provider's office if they were going to be trying to partner with you for this? Yeah, we'd love to collaborate with some providers. We would like to ask for referring their patients to us, either just hang up the flyers in the waiting room or sending out letters and emails to their patients, informing them about the study. and. Uh, Potentially also helping us with the assessments at baseline and at week 12, especially the blood draws. Otherwise, we can collect all the questionnaires, but if they can help us just with the logistics of the assessments, that would be a huge help. For people that are familiar with research, you'll know what I'm talking about. We're assuming this is IRB type of study. I mean, we've gone through all those hoops. Exactly. It's been IRB approved. That's basically it. I mean, I don't know if you can tell us. It's secret. Have, have you gotten a sense from your initial early rounds? Have you noticed any differences or can you really not talk about it at all until you've got larger numbers? As we mentioned in the beginning, we have some anecdotal evidence that this kind of intervention might help people, but we just need to really collect the data from more women to be confident about how much the diet can help on average, you know, what you can expect as an average woman going into such a dietary change, like what are your chances of improving your symptoms? All those are questions that still need to be answered based on the data where we've been collecting. I'm just going to insert something here to put in my previous question. So for those that don't know, Institutional Review Board is what IRB is. So it's kind of, if you go back to our um, history of the pill episode, we <laughs> talked about a lot of like not so ethical things that happened. And this is kind of making sure that when we're studying people, we're following all the rules, taking care of our people who have so generously donated their time and, and their bodies for research. Well, and if you're a regular listener, you know that Ruby and I talk all the time about if you're trying to change your lifestyle, like you're an N of one and you only know what happens for you. So here you can be a chance of being part of an N of 120. You can be yeah. one of the participants to not only see what it does for you, but help science.
<laughs> well, thank you so much for being researchers and contributing to such important research. We will definitely spread the word about this study and pass it on to our clinician colleagues to try to get more people involved that in this be because amazing. we want to reach maybe that 120 and beyond. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you so much for having us. Thanks for joining us for this week's episode of the Whole Pineapple Podcast. We hope it was helpful. If you know someone who could benefit from hearing the podcast, we hope you'll share it with them. And don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review The Whole Pineapple on your favorite podcast app. Every rating and review makes us easier to find. This podcast is sponsored by Seattle Reproductive Medicine and is produced by Audiotocracy Podcast Production. We'll see you next time. Have a delicious week.